be great. All right, welcome everyone. Hugo Bound Anderson here for Out of Bounds. Please introduce yourself in the chat um, and let us know where you're where, where you're dialing in from. I am super excited to be here today uh, with with Peter Wang, the new Chief AI Officer of Anaconda. Yet extensive experience, co-founder of Anaconda, done many things there o o over the years. Um, Peter, how are you? I'm well. I'm well. How are you? I'm I'm really well, man. I I got to say I. I'm, I, I love our chats and we, we we chat a bunch. We haven't chatted in a while. It's always fun to chat, but I love having public conversations with you as well. We've done podcasts together and, and that type of stuff. Yeah. So it's great to be having a, a public conversation as well. And I just want to welcome everyone. We've already got 65 people um, here and counting. We've got people from Brazil, from Boston, from London, San Francisco, Portland, Madrid, St. Louis, um, St. Louis? St. Louis, St. Louis. St. Louis. Um, is it true that? It's only St. Louis in French, I think. Well, I am in London, so it's definitively not not French. Is it true that um the city of Chicago once reversed the direction of the river because the lake was getting too dirty and pumped all the dirty water into St. Louis? I I don't know, um, but perhaps. I mean, it sounds like the sort of thing that could happen. <laughs> That's what I've heard. We've got someone already commenting Pythonistas in the house, which nice. which which I really like. Um, so, uh, just a, a bit of bookkeeping. Um, we do these fire chat side chats all the time. I'm Hugo Bound Anderson uh, of Out of Bounds, where we work on infrastructure and productivity tools for data scientists. Um, so check out outofbounds.com if this is the type of stuff that interests you. We also, um, work on open source software, a framework called Metaflow for data scientists that our intention is to abstract away all the infrastructural stuff, um, that, data scientists probably shouldn't have to be doing. So for example, we have an at Kubernetes decorator. So you can use that to send any steps of your machine learning workflows to the cloud instead of messing around with kubectl and configuration uh, file. If that's your thing, go for it. But for most data scientists, you want to be building building models. And what I'm going to do is post a link to our GitHub repository in the chat. Um, and if you want to check it out and, and give it a star, um, please do. Um, and if you like this, these types of conversations hit subscribe wherever that that button somewhere and share with your friends um all that aside let's let, let's just get into it peter um maybe we could start by you telling us a bit about about yourself um yeah so uh briefly um my uh my 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 formal background is in physics and then i um went into the software world I, i've been coding a long time and i went to the software world um right out of college um, but I started doing numerical computing and computer graphics, and then I found Python, and then I did a bunch of um, consulting and scientific and numerical Python um, in the mid 2000s at a company called Nthought. That's where I met um, the the creator of NumPy and SciPy, Travis Oliphant, um, and we eventually then a few years later we would we would found a company at the time called Continuum Analytics, now called Anaconda. We also created uh, PyData to sort of rebrand, if you will, or really take the Python ecosystem, the Python data ecosystem, numerical Python ecosystem into the data science world, into the big data world, into business computing. And so really, um, uh, you know, there are a lot of really wonderful projects that everyone uses now that are almost household names to some extent. But at the time, they were all in this niche of scientific Python programmers, and they're all my friends and whatnot. And so, um, you know, we, we sort of brought all that. I thought it was, it was, it was too valuable to be just locked up in just the scientific computing niche. Um, and when cloud computing and big data all really started hitting really hard in the beginning of the 2010s, that's when we, me and many other collaborators, we sort of launched this initiative to take Python to the business computing world. And that of course then led to the open data science movement, of course, in conjunction with R, which is also a very popular language, open source language for statistics, statistics and data science. And, um, yeah, and, and of course, we've seen now all the wonderful things that have been happening in machine learning and now AI, all those are building on top of Python for, I think, um, reasons which I, you know, I certainly have a perspective on those reasons. But anyway, um, I'm very pleased to see all that happening. And now uh, I was the, uh, well, I was CTO of Anaconda for a while, and then I was a CEO for a while, and now I'm chief AI officer to drive innovation and sort of what comes next, um, really looking at the, you know, two, three, four years uh, beyond for the company. Uh, while the rest of the excellent leadership and executive team are managing the, the continued growth and, and the build out of the company. So that's essentially me in a nutshell um, in terms of the stuff relevant to our conversation here. Yeah. Yeah. I appreciate that context. And firstly, congratulations on the new role. 
Um, I mean, we've been friends for for years now, and I've I've seen you go through a, a lot of positions there. And I remember when you know a decade ago, I used to visit your office on um, was it Sixth Street in Austin? Yep, yep, yeah. Right. Um, and and so that's that's incredible. I'm I'm really interested in what what changes for you now in your new role and what you're hmm. excited about. Yeah. So uh, so what changes is um, I don't know how many people here um, listening to this either recorded or live. Um, have been CEOs, but it's kind of like a bullshit job. <laughs> it's, there's a lot, especially if you're technical, um, there's a lot that has nothing to do with technology and a lot of it that is about managing the business. And as the company has grown and scaled, mm -hmm. there's a lot more to manage and, and do. And so we're at a point now where, um, you know, I, 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 I could not devote, last year I tried, and it was really tough to both keep tabs on top of, you know, all of the things that were happening in AI, all things are happening in the industry, right? There's AI as a research area. There's the industry around data and, and ML and data science and all this stuff. And then there's the company itself, like internally. So that's just too many decks to run up and down and around. And so um, with the new, so the change, what changes for me now is actually my schedule last year. If you looked at any week, there was probably... 15 or 20 hours out of my normal work week, which is, you know, anywhere 70, 80 hours, something like that. But there may be 15, 20 hours and I was not double booked. And just doing that all the time leaves very little time for reflection, very little time for study. That's just late night reading, whatever kind of things. And you just really, that's not sustainable. So, um, so I'm excited. What changes is that I actually can like hunker down and really get into what is happening in the Vanguard and sit down and have long conversations with people who are thought leaders in the space and see kind of what they're tracking. And it's just been uh, enormously valuable to actually restore and bring some of the, um, just really just, it's much more centered life, <laughs> honestly. Um, so I'm very excited about that. Yeah. And, and I remember something you said to me, said to me once, and I'm going to, I'm going to butcher it slightly, I think. So you can, you can correct my paraphrase, but the role of CEO is one of servitude or something like that. Yes. Yes. Ultimately any, any kind of leadership role, I think that for me, the model of leadership is uh, is really servant leadership is is the most for me the, the best, and um, and so uh, if you're leading just a team of two or three people, you have to hold space for them. If you're leading a team of two or three hundred people, you have to hold space for all of that. Ultimately, you know, you have to you're the catch-all for that. But the CEO role in particular for a business is really important because they sit at the intersection of all the business's internal needs, but they also sit at the intersection of all of the outside. So all the customers, you know, I get private Reddit DMs and Twitter DMs when people have gripes about Conda, right? Or something, you know, goes wrong with something. And like, um, and I pulled in all sorts of different directions from the outside community. So not only am I holding space for a company of several hundred people, um, but also for investors who have put hundreds of millions of dollars in the business. And I'm holding space for tens of millions of community members in the user community from experts like yourself and, and, you know, Jeremy Howard and, you know, other kinds of people, but then also holding space for the random noob who's on Reddit, like, Hey, what's going on with this like weird conda thing. So that's just a lot. This all yeah. focused on one Absolutely. I'm, I'm glad you've mentioned the users. Cause I do want to, so for everyone who's impatient to get to generative AI, we will get there, but you can go on Twitter for that as well. No, I'm joking. Very grateful to have you, ha have you all here, <laughs> but we will get to generative AI, but I want to talk about, um, Pi data a, a bit more because well, what he's doing is he's basically loading more interesting stuff into the prompt. So the output of our generative AI conversation will be richer uh, and, and better tuned. So anyway, <laughs> I would I can't wait for a, ge a generated conversation. One of the funniest things I saw recently was it was a, a a generated Joe Rogan and a generated Jordan Peterson doing a critique of a Super Mario Kart video or something like that. It was absolutely. That's the future of content as far as, as far as I'm concerned. But, um, and we've got a question already around using LLMs to generate code, which I'm really excited to get your- mm, There we go, yeah, yeah. But before we get there, um, I just wanna say a few things about the PyData ecosystem. I wanna give a few data points that you're aware of, but recently Project Jupiter was recognized by the White House. Mm -hmm. A couple of years ago, um, NumPy got its nature paper, which, and all of these things, as far as I'm concerned are fantastic, but, uh, uh, should have been due a, a decade ago. Well, maybe get five, five, five to 10 years. Um, a f some years ago, we saw Matplotlib and, and NumPy had been used to um, to detect um, gravitational waves predicted by Einstein. So these are a few 
data data points of kind of the impact of the Pi Data ecosystem. So maybe you could just, for those who don't know so much, tell us a bit about Pi Data more generally, and then about its impact. Yeah, uh, Pi Data more generally. Well, uh, I sort of cheekily said that you know Pi Data was really a, a rebrand and a marketing effort around the scientific Python tools mm. to go into business, and and that's all absolutely true. And uh, but then it's going to something much more than that, right? And and really the big deal here, I think, for for people who may not know kind of how all the stuff kind of went down, um, a lot of programming languages, most programming languages, are designed to tell computers what to do at a very low level. And, and or you write business applications and you're, you know, connecting to like device drivers, you're doing different kinds of widgets and all these kinds of things. But to actually use a computer to crunch numbers, right, to do math, which is what computers were originally invented for, there's actually most mainstream programming languages are, they don't have out of the box tools to do that easily. Now, of course, you can always write your own for loops over all these numbers and add all these up and do all this stuff. But once you get beyond the very basics, there's a lot of what we call numerical algorithms that are really important to do accurately and do well and do fast um, over large amounts of numbers. And in the world, people who need to do that kind of thing, they've tended to gravitate towards languages that were historically proprietary, closed source languages like MATLAB or Mathematica. You have to pay lots of money for those pieces of software. And those do engineering and scientific computing. So every single piece of engineered equipment you deal with in the world, everything you use, all these things are created uh, ultimately through engineering processes that intersect these kinds of tools. The Python language, however, was interesting in that as a mainstream programming language, which you can use to make Dropbox or Instagram or make you know shell scripts to do various things on a computer, it was extensible enough to glom on a set of numerical computing extensions in a way that, and the language itself was nice enough that people who are scientists and engineers who are not software engineers, not software developers, they don't have a CS degree, these people could use this language to go and do math and do numbers and detect black holes and calculate the flow of air over an airfoil and, and, and all these things. So the ability for Python to be extended in this way by people like Travis Oliphant, the creator of NumPy and SciPy, the, uh, or by, by Fernando Perez or John Hunter, creator of Matplotlib, right? All these different folks were able to extend and so we could grow a scientific and numerical computing community around this core language. There were technological and let's say human factor ecosystem organizational aspects that allowed that kind of an extension culture to develop around this language. And now of course, um, that language, those tools and, and all that stuff was powerful enough to go and just eat up a lot of use cases in big data and, and business data computing and processing to the point now where Python is now available inside Excel so the most popular analysis environment in the world now has recognized, yeah, people want to use Python. So now Python is available in the formula bar of Excel. And we you know, worked with Microsoft on, on kind of making that happen. But that basically is, uh, I don't know if that answers your question about like the PyData ecosystem, but really at the end of the day, if you're not just clicking and swiping widgets, if you're not just like grabbing a row out of database and shoving it into another place in the database, if you, what you actually want to do is have you know, compute on numbers and use numbers and quantitative thinking that models the world and ask questions about it. And what's the optimal way to do this? Or how does that, if, if I made this thing, this other shape, how would it work? Those kinds of questions are all what we call numerical computing. And I think Python has been transformative for that. This has made it accessible to everyone in the world. And it's created by a volunteer community. So it is a really wonderful thing to be to have been at the center of that. Absolutely. And I, I think that's a wonderful introduction to it. And as you made clear, the impact isn't only across science, but across all forms of uh, industry. And just for those who maybe don't don't know so much about this, like we are talking about NumPy, Pandas, uh, Project Jupyter, Matplotlib, Dask for distributed compute. Um, of course, when people build on top of top of these things with wonderful packages such as such as Bokeh, which which you you began and have worked on, but there there's an entire up to AstroPy, right? Of course, Scikit-Learn. There's a wonderful mm -hmm. array, um, pun partially in, in, intended. Um, you have to call it uh, Tensor now. You have to call it Tensor now. Well, that's the premium well, version of live stream. We have to call it Tensor on the premium. That's version. actually to <laughs> to my next point. I mean, a lot of what we're seeing now, in in some sense, um, the Pi Data stack has become infrastructure and yeah. wonderfully a boring infrastructure. And I mean, boring is the greatest compliment. It's stable. It's foundational. It's well documented. Easy to use. All all of these things, right? So I'm wondering now. Um, 
I want to I want to kind of dive into at some point what this can tell us about the future of generative AI, particularly open open source stuff. Um, mm -hmm. But but before that, I'd just like to get your general take on what's happened recently. So maybe I'll position it as some people are thinking of generative AI as the next electricity. Um, mm -hmm. Others may be like it's a bit more Bitcoiny. Um, so. Electricity or Bitcoin? What what are we dealing with here, Peter? Uh, the Elder Wand. Are you a Harry Potter fan? I've I've actually never seen or read any Harry Potter. I feel oh, horrible no. a, 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 um, about this. So we have to be really careful in uh, in in not going out, taking the conversation out beyond the edge of the solar system. But to make it very concrete, I think what people are familiar with thinking about the world is tools and infrastructure, right? Mm -hmm. Um, and and I don't know about. I would say that the impact of generative AI on humanity will be no less than the impact of electricity on humanity. I don't, I have no, no doubt in my mind that mm. is going to be the case. Yep. Um, Bitcoin brings its own baggage as an example or as a whatever. Of course. So yeah. Yeah. Not use Bitcoin, but I will talk about tools and the nature of tools. And this actually is relevant to both Python, PyData, um, modular ecosystems of, of libraries, as well as the nature of software itself, the nature of a computer and what an LM can do for us and what it can't, right? And so I think that uh, most tools that people have a intuition for, uh, most people are not shaped by the tools they use. Well, they don't think they're shaped by the tools they use, right? Most of us are not tradesmen or craftsmen anymore where you might have, you might be a butcher and there's a butcher block and a cleaver and over your decades of cutting meat, you know, your hands shape the wood and the wood shapes your hands and the butcher block kind of, you know, any of the artisanal kind of things, they have a wear to them. And there's mm -hmm. a, 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 an unavoidable reflection of the wielder of the tool. And, and they, these things shape each other. When we use cognitive tools, um, now we do, of course, have to bend our mind a little bit. We have to learn the tool. If you're learning a new BI tool for visualization, if you're learning a new, uh, let's say you're learning Figma or Miro or using Airtable or you're using you know, whatever, uh, if you're a data scientist and you're learning SQL the first time, if you're a data analyst who knows SQL and you're learning R or Python the first time, your brain has to shape a little bit and you learn some new cognitive skills. And actually those do inform how you look at the world, how you think about mm -hmm. the world, but it's much, like, much less visible. It's like learning a new language. Um, uh, so you can say certain things, you can think certain thoughts maybe that you couldn't have thought before. What, but ultimately what LLMs do that I think the way they change us is that they call into deep question what of the uh, cognitive arts, the intellectual pursuits that we do, what of those are low level sort of bullshit rendering and what of those are actually high level value added cognition? Mm -hmm. Because the low level rendering stuff and the high level cognition stuff, um, LLMs seem like they can do both, right? Because some high level cognition, it is searching. You need an, like, if you're an expert, what differentiates an expert, expert, uh, let's say doctor who's been in the field of some specialty for 30 years versus someone who's new right out of residency? Well, the difference is the expert has seen many cases. They have, they have read the literature for decades. They've seen these things and they can search very efficiently a much vaster space of things, a much larger space of things. Well, an LLM doesn't need to be an expert, but it's literally read a million lifetimes worth of books. So you can just brute force and it could just tell you exactly which paragraph out of which chapter, out of which section, out of which legal reference document is relevant to this specific aspect of this case you're looking at. There is no human on earth that could do that, no matter how much of a savant they are, right? So there are certain things that we had put in the category of high level cognition, which LLMs will just do, okay? And then there's certain things that we have put in the low level part of cognition, you know, rendering certain kinds of things, writing certain kinds of documents, preparing certain kinds of things, and LMs do those trivially as well. And so the thing that they ask us now is, is sort of a, maybe to bring this full circle, we've always thought of everything in the world as being tools that we wield. And we recognize that even in the intellectual tools, the abstract tools we use, they can mold us somewhat. But we've never really created a generalizable meta tool that then crowds out and can do everything and that sort of crowds out the space for where the tool maker or the tool wielder even sits. Where do you put the cockpit? In a plane that can fly itself, right? And so that's why I think we have to be very careful in thinking about how we how we shape that plane, how we want these kinds of planes to fly, what is right and what is not right for LLMs to do. You know, those are questions we have to actually ask front and center.
Absolutely. And I think this dovetails really nicely into the question that was already asked in the chat. Coding assistance for people right. of, like us who who write software. And I mean, you're someone, and I'm interested in what you do with your work now, because as a CEO, you didn't get to code as much as, and you you grew up coding and lo lo love coding, right? So I do what, love it. what happens to people who love coding and writing writing software now? I think the things, different people are drawn to different parts of, of coding. What I, This is what I've seen in, in my life. So some people really like the problem solving part of the challenge. And I like that too, right? So I, mm -hmm. I, um, I think, unfortunately, some of those kinds of things are going to go away. I don't think you're going to have to do that very much anymore. Uh, some of the low level problem solving bits. Um, because we're moving to a much, much more industrial, I think we'll move to a much, is a much more industrialized way of building software. Um, and so um, that may leave lesser room for doing things like sitting there and figuring out how to solve like a project Euler thing or do something in a very clever way. Mm. Um, so I think some of that might go away. Uh, other reasons that people like to build software is they actually want to express certain ideas or there's certain things you want to tie together and try to build new interfaces. That's actually been um, a, a bit of a lost art to some extent. And I think those people might find their, their wings can now spread much further. Um, they don't have to know all these details of all these different frameworks and stuff. The LLM can help them figure that out. And they can now sort of, you know, almost have a co literally a co-pilot um, that helps them navigate the vagaries of all these different toolkits. And they can actually manifest something much more creative and interesting. So I think software could become a much more interesting and accessible medium for putting ideas out there. And, and that's the part that excites me. I loved making games when I started programming and games had much a lower bar uh, back in the day when I, was, when I started coding. So it was fun to make games. And I think that's a really, that might be a thing that people you know get into more. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I'm, I think that actually where this goes in a, in to some extent is that the nature of uh, modularity and code reuse and even APIs um, can, can you hear that? There's a bit of noise outside my office. Is that- I, I, I can hear it. Yeah. Okay. I don't know. Um, it just goes for a bit. That's fine. Yeah. Um, so, <laughs> uh, sorry about that. So in any case, let me pull this a little bit closer. Um, so I think that basically um, we're going to build modular, like the point of reuse right now is like a code module or a package mm -hmm. uh, or a library with an API. And I think we'll actually um, move to a place where we're going to build these things to be usable by LLMs and people will script over the LLMs in that way. I think, I think yep. so. Um, yeah. Um, I can, I can try to tell them to stop for a little. I did not realize that they were going to be. Doing yeah, this maybe. Right if now. You, yeah. Let me do that. Yeah, Sorry, absolutely. One second. We'll have a brief intermission, everyone. Um, and I am interested. What I'm going to ask Peter next is actually um, one of the questions we had in the chat uh, around, uh, Python efficiency versus C++, for example. But to that point, um, any in, in any questions you have, please do put in the chat and we'll do our best to to get to them. Um, and I'm very excited um, to hear Peter's answer to that as well. Literally a jackhammer. Literally a jackhammer. So, Amazing. Um, um, funnily, <laughs> um, when, when I used to record... Um, uh, courses which you came in and did did some of in in, in New York City. You remember that recording studio? I do remember that. We, yeah, we went to. Um, there were jackhammers out, and it's it's Midtown Manhattan, right? So like you can't like you can have as much soundproofing as you want, but it's not gonna. And but these guys were hustlers, man. One of them, I think maybe it was even when Brian Vandervan was in. But one mm. one of the, one of the guys in the studio went out and gave the dudes doing the jackhammering. 300 bucks and said, go, go and buy yourself a nice lunch for two hours or something, something like that. And that's how we stopped the, the jackhammering for, for the, the, the certain amount of time. But um, what I did want to get to is a question. Well, the problem is I'm paying these guys to jackhammer. So I kind of want. <laughs> that's, that's a problem. Exactly. Oh no. Um, no, it's, not, it's fine. I um We've had a question in the chat that I'm interested in the answer to. And okay. All right. many others as well. Python. Python has eaten the world, uh, uh, of course. Um, there mm -hmm. are, I suppose, um, the person in the chat has used the word complaints. Um, complaints against <laughs> Python that it is 100 
uh, times less efficient than C++, for example. Um, what are your thoughts on this and how does it- Oh, this one, yes. How does it, how is, does it bode right. for the future? Uh, oh my God. I'm uh, sorry, I'm gonna take a minute de to de-spicify my answer. Absolutely. Um, no, no, let's get spicy. It, it, I might, mean, it might come out a little spicy. Um, no, let's get, let's get. I think the, the right way to really think about this is what it means for a language to be efficient, efficient doing what, right? Um, and the reason for, so th that particular paper is hot trash. And I would absolutely love to debate the authors of it on a live mic stick. So maybe we should invite them to PyCon and everyone will get hammered. I'll have a bottle of whiskey up there and I will just flame these guys because that is such it, you know, in physics, we have this term of being not even wrong. Yep. That is not even wrong because you're not looking at what the actual end objective is. Hey, if you just want to do Fibonacci series, yeah, you probably shouldn't do it in Python, raw Python by itself, right? If you want to do matrix multiplies, you shouldn't do it in pure Python. You should probably be using something like NumPy to do that or heck, KuPy if you have a GPU, right? Like yep. the, it's, I don't even know, it's like, Yes, an airplane is much, much more inefficient as a paperweight than a brick. But I mean, they're kind of different things. So if you want to empower a world of physicists, geneticists, machine learning researchers, neuroscientists to actually build AI, you can give them something like Python, which is a little less efficient for some of their code, but actually not that less efficient at the math part of it, which is what most of the cycles are spent on. Or you can give them C and C++ where they will just never get there. They will spend all their days so they'll burn a lot of compute. They'll debug seg faults. They'll rebuild libraries and step on each other's toes, rebuilding shit all the time and never actually get there. So choose your own adventure, right? I think that the, 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 the complaints about Python being inefficient uh, in that particular paper, that study that got just, it was the whole thing about a lie can go you know around the world before the truth has got its shoelaces on. That thing made me so mad because it anchored so much bad thinking about what is the point of a computer language? And this actually comes right back to the LLMs because we're going to actually very soon be able to synthesize information systems and cognitive systems without actually having to write code. We're going to get very good at thinking about what the right way to synthesize it is because if you know how code works, you'll do a better job than if you don't. But ultimately, the question is, what are we even trying to do with, with programming systems at all? Because anyone will tell you, an Intel engineer will tell you, yeah, you could write the tightest C code. You can take the, whoever, the authors of the paper, they think they're like, oh, C code is so much so efficient. Every CPU manufacturer on the sun, if they're being honest, under the sun will tell you that if you're getting even 1% of the peak utilization of your CPU, you're doing great. Most CPUs, all of the time and energy and the billions of dollars we spend building fabs to make CPUs and to plug them into computers and put them in data centers and power them with hundreds of watts, they sit there doing nothing. They sit mm -hmm. there literally doing nothing, okay? So, so that is, you know, how do you most efficiently use all that stuff? Well, C is not going to be the answer either the right algorithm solving the right problem is the way to get to performance, right? So there's a, to, to, no, I'm not, I'm definitely getting a little, I can sense my own sort of like psychosomatic state getting spicier about this. So let me just make a very concrete example. There was a, uh, I think it was that super computing, there was a Python session. And um, uh, one of the, this is, this is back in the, in the late 2000, I don't know, no, early 2010s. Um, the Numba project had just been around for a few years, and that's a compiler project that we built at Anaconda that lets you put a decorator on a piece of code, and you can call NumPy functions, you can write, you know, whatever kinds of things, and it will actually turn it into machine code for you, so lower mm -hmm. level than C. Um, and so um, this one researcher from the European Space Agency, or maybe the German Space Agency, whatever, they had, they were going to benchmark C++ or Python, because that was during the early ascendancy of Python, PyData, right, in the early 2010s and they were baking this out and um, they wrote this code and they wrote it in C++ and yes, it was definitely faster than Python code, but it took them much, much longer to write it. When they went and did the Python version, they realized after they did the first, they, they did the Python version in a matter of like a week and then they realized, oh wait, we can improve the algorithm this way and that way. And so basically in less than half the time it took to write the C++ version, they had built three revs. They've read their algorithm three times with Python. And then the net performance of that thing was way faster than C++. Yep. And so, so you can go and drive. So an F1 car is way faster than, than my Volvo. But you know what? If you don't have a windshield out that thing, you can't see where you're going in the problem space. It doesn't matter, right? Yes, and so that's why I'm so angry about that paper 
because it's just like putting an F1 car with no windshield or maybe whatever, like just a fast brick, you know, and you put like a Honda Civic on a dynamometer. Yes, one will definitely rev more horsepower than the other, but to what end, right? Anyway. Yeah. And I think to, to your point, one of the most now. one of the most important things is the, the tension between developer time and comp computational time and what we're prioritizing, right? And we, we do want to build human-centric tools, which allow everyone to build um, data-powered, AI-powered, machine learning-powered software. Yes. On top of that, Python, as we say, is the second best language for everything, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. It's rarely well, the and, first and best, but it's the Swiss army knife. There's, there's a flip side of that. So, so two pieces of this both come in. Um, when, when, when Travis and I were getting our start in, uh, you know, before we started Anaconda, we were consultants for a while and some of the big companies we would consult at would be filled with, with Java programmers. This is the late, late two thousands, right? So there's a lot of .NET, there's a lot of Java. Uh, I think Java was making the transition from all these enterprise Java beans and J2E stuff to like, you know, all these other kinds of random stuff. In any case, um, and these big businesses, big companies, the way that in-house software development work was that somebody somewhere in a line of business would need something done. They figure out a spec, they spec out a project, they give it to the in-house developers. IT would spin up infrastructure. The in-house developers would spend a bunch of time coding some stuff, throw it over the fence, back and forth, back and forth. And over the course of years, some kind of application, internal application would get built. Okay. Yep. We go in there with Python. We usually get called into these places because somebody, we call them a subject matter expert, a SME, right? Subject matter expert or a domain expert. They would be sitting in the lines of business and they would have picked up Python on the weekend or they would have you know, somehow stumbled into Python. They would have built a crude thing on their own that kind of does the right bits, but they were just at the limit of what they could do because they're not software engineers. They would call us in as consultants to work at that line of business and help them take it to the next level and kind of finish this out. And so I would always come in and get thrown right into the lion's den of being surrounded by a bunch of Java consultants telling me how terrible Python was. Mm. I'm like, it may be terrible, but the dude over here in your business that's helping you make money needs this done. And he wrote or she wrote what they needed in the clearest possible way, which is not a spec document with UML document with all this UML and XML markup. What they wrote was a piece of working code, a prototype. And we just need to flesh out the prototype as simple as possible and do this efficiently. And usually it could be done with a 10th of the team of the pile of Java people. And it could be done at more efficiency actually, because a lot of this stuff was big number crunching stuff, big data processing stuff. And between, you know, um, uh, Pi tables and, and NumPy at the time, even some of the tools like Cython, we could knock it out and be C speed or faster. Um, so, so this idea of having a tool that fits in the head of the person who knows the job to be done is incredibly important. And then to your point about the second best language, the flip side of that whole statement of Python is the second best language for everything. The flip side is that Python renders the information computing environment accessible to yep. the person who knows what they want to do with it. And the sad truth is, and this is no offense to all of my brethren in the software, um, brethren, sister in, what is the right term, the more inclusive term, to all my colleagues in the software industry, no offense to any of you, but in general, most software engineers who are in-house in the business doing kind of software development kind of things, they tend to be somewhat isolated. Um, you know, software developers can be very isolated from the actual business problems. Mm. And, and, and that air gap between the brain of the person who knows the CS theory and the brain of the person who knows the business problem, that air gap is where a lot of efficiency falls. Uh, you know, it, it dies in that air gap. Yeah, absolutely. Um, we have another great question from, from the chat. Nor Norberto wants to know, what do you, Peter, think about Mojo, which is designed as a superset of Python that can be compiled and in theory be more efficient? Yeah, I think time will tell. I think it's great that people are experimenting with, with new languages and doing these kinds of things. Python is... Um, Certainly, it has it has warts all over the place. There's all sorts of things mm. that are imperfect, right? We we didn't have time to create the perfect language because it was the perfect language for the for the time, that moment in time when it was needed. Now, looking forward, I think that um, Mojo itself. Well, we'll see. There's some things that that um, are are really interesting about it. Um, but as a superset of Python, I think where it um, where it might run into challenges is that, well, okay, let's see here. The best way to say this is the, the, the problem with Python is that it is used in lots of different places. It's used like everywhere, places you can't imagine. And people do all sorts of things with it. And so 
we've seen many, many sort of optimizing Python, high performance Python kinds of projects come over, out over the years that get to an interesting point of efficacy at speeding up certain kinds of things. And then they can't get beyond that because there's so much out there. And you basically, it's a death by a thousand cuts of corner cases and edge cases. So I think the challenge that Mojo will have to somehow get over if it's to be successful is that it's sort of an opposite uh, problem than like Julia has, right? So the Mojo problem is that there's no cold start. There's millions of people who use Python. The problem is there's a million variants of how Python gets used. And optimization, as we all know, is an incredibly finicky sort of thing. It depends on the use case. It depends on actually the hardware you run on. And at the end of the day, maybe all you can really do is speed up one hot loop. And now you're 30% faster on a task. Was that worth learning a whole different way of thinking about things? And I know that Mojo says it's a strict superset and all this stuff. But from what I've seen of it, there will be a certain adoption learning curve for people to, to adopt and learn it. Um, so I think we'll, we'll see. But I do celebrate, of course, um, any efforts to make Python more efficient because my rant about the whole Python is 100 times less efficient than C thing aside, I do think there's lots of ways we can make, make Python more efficient. We have some projects happening at Anaconda, in fact, that are about moving Python to a higher performance ecosystem. But we see it as an ecosystem challenge more than a particular language challenge. There are already tools out there that are supersets of Python, like Cython. That's what Pandas written in, right? Um, those are the things that, that people have been using for a long time to do accelerated Python. So we'll, we'll, I think um, it's too early to say yet about Mojo. I think there's a lot of nuances of language design that, of course, Chris Latner is a genius and um, you know built things like LVM, MLIR, um, would never doubt his technical expertise in this area. But where Python adoption of any tool of the Python, you know, any, sorry, where the Python ecosystem challenges lie are outside of just a technical challenge. It is an ecosystem kind of uh, sort of challenge. And so it'll be interesting to see how that goes. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so now I do want to jump more into the generative AI stuff. I'm interested mm -hmm. as someone who's been deep in the open source Python e ecosystem um, as a builder, um, what are your thoughts on, let me get this right, the ability of open source generative AI models to take a significant part of the landscape. And I think one reason it differs, just to set the seat a bit more, one reason it, it differs to the PyData ecosystem is the massive compute needed, essentially, um, and the cost incurred there. Of course, we don't talk enough about, you know, the human costs or labor costs of everyone, including yourself, who built and continues to build the PyData ecosystem, right? But mm -hmm. we have, it seems like there's a lot more value obviously captured by um, vendors with mm -hmm. when there's significant compute costs and closed models uh, possible. Yes. Um, as of the current state of our knowledge, uh, I would say the state of the art in the publicly knowledge public knowledge of the state of the art of the industry circa, you know, whatever, um, end of March, 2024, yeah. it certainly does seem like a large amount of compute and a large amount of um, training data is necessary to build an effective model. Um, and the reason I say that so explicitly is because I believe that orders of magnitude changes uh, are still um in in the offing so i think that we will it's see very early isn't it i think we forget it's in very, the conversation very early. and most of the conversation is noise currently as well so right i was actually and this is part of the benefit of of not having to be ceo anymore um i spent some time the last few days kind of rereading the the bert paper and actually looking at bert of mm. all things uh and not not even gpt right but but looking at bert and um you know what's interesting is um the what works today is so incredible, incredibly crude compared to uh, when you look at the elegance of how the actual human brain works. I was also watching um, just neither here nor there, but last night I was watching an interview with someone who uh, is doing work in more brain mimicry sort of neural sort of things. And, and the human brain is so incredibly efficient and the architecture is so radically different than like these like one hot encodings of, you know, these giant vectors being densely multiplied in a fully connected network, like all the stuff we're actually doing today for the cutting edge GPT 4.5, whatever kind of stuff, it's actually conceptually a very, very brute force model that just mm. happens to work. Yeah. So I think that there are order of orders of magnitude of efficiency gains available. 
that we will go get. And actually, the is it Groke? What are the, the hardware, the the, the inference yeah. hardware that just recently came out? Right. That's that's just baking the inference loop into an ASIC. That's all that was, right? Like to mm. some extent. Um, so I think that there's a there's there's that. So I wouldn't say that we're forever, oh no, now the end of the end of open source, right? Because uh you have to have a a hundred billion dollars to to tithe to to Jensen before you can even touch the stuff. I don't think that will be the case um, in the long run and certainly in any kind of equilibrium state. Now, the second piece is the training data, right? Also, the current models are brute force, require a ton of tokens to go in there and do a thing. Um, but the training data stuff is like legally kind of in a weird state, right? Now, I know that, for instance, for the co-pilot or some of these other things, when they train off of uh, public of uh, open source code, they make sure to try to avoid GPL code and some of these other kinds of things. But all of software right now is transmitted under, not all, but most software is transmitted under a set of legal provisions that are rooted in copyright. And then a bespoke license, you know, there's a license at TXT inside every GitHub repo. That's, this is BSD, this is Apache 2, this is LGPL, whatever. Um, and the, But that's all still under the context of copyright. And so however the courts swing on copyright and fair use, um, you may see that the open source ecosystem, the creator of a piece of work may say, well, hold on, I have rights on this work. I don't want this to be part of this training data set, right? Or if it's part of a training data set, I need to get a few nickels if you're making a few dollars. Like there's something about this calculus that isn't right. So I think that right now we're in early days on both the technology and we're in early days on the legal and economic infrastructure of how this goes. Um, because, and, and the reason this is important on the open source side is because the historical, let's say, social contract of open source, again, it was software transmission for other users to use it. And um, I think Richard Stallman articulated this pretty well, which is this idea that it's software free, software is something you do with the hardware, the computer you bought, you have a freedom over it. If I buy a pencil, who are you to tell me I can't write certain things on the pencil? If I buy a, pro a computer that can run uh, any kind of instructions, who are you to tell me I can't write certain instructions to have the computer do it? So open source software has a very simple, not very many steps before it's rooted in the sort of the moral rights of man at a philosophic level, right? To say that I bought a computer, I, the computer is a programmable general purpose computer. I can put instructions in there to have the computer do things. And you and I as friends can share instructions with each other. And when we share instructions, I can put a covenant in there to say that, hey, if you take the, the recipe that I gave you for the computer, just make sure to just pay it forward. If you make any modifications, make sure you share them with some other people, right? Um, don't don't be a don't be a d bag and take my thing and then make a ton of money off of it and never give me anything. Like there's a little few things like that that you can put in there. But even actually in the case of like BSD and MIT licenses, you can you can take my thing and go and do whatever you want with it. You can make money off it. You don't have to pay me, right? So we have a social contract though, however, that is rooted in the liberty, the freedom of people to do what they want with computers. That social contract now with LLMs, um, it feels like there's a different social contract that needs to be had <laughs> when these things now are creating novel code that then potentially displace the economic opportunities for lots of people. Like there's a different thing. Maybe I didn't want to be part of that. Maybe I don't want to be part of that displacement, right? And there's no room for me to say right now in the world, there's no legal space for me to say, Hugo, you can take my code and do whatever you want with it. And have a good time, but Hugo, you as the as the officer of Hugo Inc., you cannot take this code and generate stuff that then displaces me and all my friends from being able to find gainful employment. Right? There is no space legally for for me to even have that conversation right now because because the way the LLMs treat training data that is legally unsettled space. Mm. So I think that open source as a concept has to evolve and has to kind of get back down to the roots. The, the philosophical moral roots. So what was the point of the movement? Was it just a purely technical libertarian kind of thing? Was it actually like in the case of the PyData ecosystem? And I think a lot about this and I've spoken a lot about this actually in keynotes and things like that. Uh, it, was it really about a human ecology and a, a, a non-rivalrous generative a gift culture, right? The LLM is not part of the gift culture if the LLM is closed source, right? So these are the kinds of things that, that I think we have to somehow get very, grow up very quickly as an industry and as a practitioner community, as a maker community and have those conversations. Absolutely. And I think, firstly, I love that you, you know, reference gifting culture. I think we can all learn a lot more, a lot from the gift and, and the work of Marcel Mauss. I 
I do want your thoughts on the amount of mind share that's currently occupied by, I suppose, analogs of the statement, bigger is better in terms of hardware, models, training data, all, all of these things. Because what I'm hearing is that in the future we have, it isn't necessarily bigger it is better, but there are people who say bigger is better, who I suppose have a lot of our bandwidth and have vested interests in that statement as well. Yeah, of course, of course. Um, you know, bigger is better uh, was the uh, was the mantra for the dirigibles and the zeppelins as well until some couple of bicycle makers figured out the propeller, right? So, well, and the aileron is a really important thing too. But the the, the point is that you know, powered flight was a thing and it was bigger, it was better and you get the Hindenburg, right? Um, but then you figure out a different way to make things fly. And I think we're going to find, look, we are surrounded by proof points that high level, high functioning cognition can be extremely uh, power efficient. And I think what's important, well, power efficient is not even the thing. Um, we, we know we have we have a model of cognition that works, we, and that, that's the human brain. That's mouse brains, primate brains, whatever. Um, and what we've got is something that seems to uncover latent uh, latent representation space by processing all of the artifacts of the cognition. Right, every single thing that goes mm -hmm. in the training data set is actually the downstream data exhaust, if you will. Uh, it, it would seem odd to call a Shakespearean sonnet data exhaust, but it really is the capture, uh, the rendering into a text form, into a particular encoding, which is language, by a brain that was extant in the world doing brain things in the world. So I think that, that, that if we want to talk about where this ultimately goes, we do need to ask a bit about the ends. To what ends, right? Um, because I think if you want to actually have things that help humans get better, that improve the world for us, we need a lot of embedded cognition in all sorts of places. And that then in, in, intrinsically shortens the, the, the path between sensor and actuator and, and cogitator. And also it reduces dramatically the power footprint. Not every it, single robot that you have in the Amazon or in the whatever, the Mekong River cleaning up the Delta or whatever, not every one of them can be tethered to a giant data center, right? Nor does it need to be. So I think that the actual right now, at this point in time, sure, lots of people have a vested interest in making the argument bigger is better. I think that the impact of this next generation of cognitive technologies and, and whatnot, it's going to have uh, constraints, which then will shape the engineering challenges, uh, whether those constraints are size or whether they're energy or, or latency, what have you. Um, and, and so, you know, the constraints make the art, right? So. Absolutely. Um, so Did I'm that answer the question? That was just yeah, like, yeah. Like, no, okay, absolutely. Right. Yeah. Um, I, um, what happens? So now Pi Data is really infrastructure for so many things with the advent of generative AI. What, what happens to Pi Data now? What's the future of Pi Data look like? I didn't mean to sound that. Yeah. <laughs> what, what's the future of Pi Data with all of these new tools and technologies? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, let's see here. <clears throat> You're actually the first person to really ask me that on the record. So I'm going to be really careful here what I say. Um, awesome. so I think that for a good long time, we're still going to require legibility in cybernetics, which is to say that we're going to want to understand, even if we have things that are smarter than us, that can see more, that can process faster, we're going to want to understand what they're doing. We're going to demand accountability for how they're predicting and simulating. And so what that means is we need a machine, we need a language. And that language can be math. We can say, well, we just write math, uh, maybe not LaTeX, but math. Um, and that could be very much the way it is. Um, but but it, it, in any particular scenario where we need to encode data, when we need to encode the structure of data, when we need to talk about this and that and the other, I think there will be the need for a language or some kind of interface between the human and the machine that can encapsulate those different concepts. So maybe less of how we do things, but just an understanding of what it is that is even being done. Hmm. And that language, I think ultimately, you know, Python's good enough to serve that role right now. Python may evolve into a pigeon version of Python that in the same way that English became sort of this variant of like, you know, uh, whatever, a bunch of different languages off the continent, right? Um, there's like Germanic roots and there's Latin roots and other stuff. But at the end of the day, we may end up with some 
you know, bastardized variant of, of Python that has SQL built in, and that's got some other orchestration bits, that's got some prompt um, macro capabilities built into it, whatever it might be. But ultimately, the question of like, okay, big giant LLM in the sky, what did you actually do to get to this result? Yep. We're going to want to snap to data. We're going to want to actually give us like a data frame or a giant array. And we can then take that and put in a different system and say, given this array, apply this math to it and what comes out the other end. Right? And just to stop you for one second, we're also probably going to want to take that array or data frame and introspect it using the REPL in a Jupyter notebook and maybe use Matplotlib or Seaborn or something like that on top of it. Maybe compute some summary statistics using NumPy or use Bootstrap. You know, there's all of these underlying technologies which we'll be constantly using. Right, it's, it's sort of like, a, it, it's we want, not a paper trail, but what you really want is you want this like, in the same way that we interface with other people, right? If I go and I talk to a, a data analyst and I say, well, I got this business problem. Um, here's the various data sources to look at. Here's kind of what, you, you know, whatever, some definitions of terms and semantics, come back with a result. And they come back with a result and they give me a number. And I'm like, well, I don't know if I trust that number. Like, how'd you get to that number? Or like, wait, that number's weird. What happened here, right? What's the number tomorrow? Well, what if I did this? How would the number change? And all of a sudden, you want it to show you its work. And so we're going to want LLMs. Maybe I don't even want to go to the details of saying, fire me up a Jupyter Notebook and you know, load some you know, pd.readcsv. I might just say, well, give me the summary results of this, that, and the other. But at any point in time, I want to be able to hit a button and have it show me exactly the work that it did. Right. And there's a accountability around that. And this gets down to actually answering some of the questions around generative code here as well that showed up. At the end of the day, we are still ultimately a human ecology of humans living under social contracts, humans that hold other humans accountable. And so it is not acceptable now or I think in any time in the near future to simply say, well, the machine did that. I'm, I'm sorry. I mean, granted, it was my machine and it was code written by a guy I paid, but but the machine did it, right? That's just not going to fly in a court of law. <laughs> like if the machine did, it kills my kid. I'm going to get down to the root of like changing the law, right? So I think as long as we live in a human ecology of humans holding each other accountable, that we're going to need to have paper trails. We're going to need to actually have these kinds of things. And so um, uh, a thing I was saying last year, uh, uh, but I haven't said in a while, is this idea that even if LLMs can write Python, right? In the future, I think a lot more Python code will be written, probably maybe not by humans, but uh, a lot more Python code will certainly need to be read by humans. Yes, that's right. I, I've always, when people ask me, how do I get coding and that type of stuff? One of the things I tell people is not enough people read code, dude. Like you go through GitHub and you can you can find so many inc incredible things. And GitHub actually has lots of nice affordances to recommend code to you and, and that yeah. type of stuff, but learn to read code. And that's going to be more important than ever moving forward. Yeah, so it's possible, you know, there was a time when we didn't teach kids Algebra, you taught arithmetic, right? Even just 150 years ago, actually a lot of people couldn't read. Like the idea of even literacy of language is a relatively new concept within the last yeah. four generations of humans at a broad scale um, in the West. And now, you know, in, in the, in the post-war, you know, getting a certain level of, of, of uh, understanding of mathematics, basic geometry and algebra. Okay, a lot of people actually adults are not very good with that, but it is a good thing to know. But I think you're going to end up in a world where you cannot really do knowledge work unless you can also read, um, you know, you have to read a bit of contracts. I mean, not everyone has to be a lawyer, but everyone's got to be able to read some contracts and have some ability to understand legalese. And then I think you're going to need to be able to read some code because you're going to have to ask the machine to compute some stuff for you and then give you an answer. But if you can't, sh if you can't look over there and see that it did something completely bonkers, like looked up at the wrong table or the wrong database then you're not going to make it very long in the business world because why would someone else trust you to be able to drive these computers to do this amazing stuff, right? So I think that legibility is so important. And this is one of those areas where Python uniquely was able to get the scientific computing community on mm -hmm. board because it was a language that you know um, was designed, it kind of came out of a, a lineage, a pedigree of uh, Guido's research into computer programming for everyone. Um, and the language like ABC and, and self and things like that before that were around how can we make something that was nice and somewhat human-like in its expression, executable pseudocode, I think, as Peter Norvig called it. And I think the Python's legibility was amazingly useful for um, getting the, the original scientific and numerical computing community on board. And now I think it's going to be the saving grace that carries it 
many, many years into the future, no matter how inefficient it might be in its execution for certain kinds of small tasks, right? So I think that's um, that's the future of Pi Data, I think is, a, is the long one. We do have to fix certain things about the ecosystem. We have to make code more modular. We have to make it so that people can snap pieces together and have some sense of reproducibility in the execution, right? Those are the kinds of problems which, you know, uh, need to get solved, but, but I think we'll get there. I don't think they're unsolvable. Absolutely. I really appreciate that, that nuanced take. And I, I'm glad you brought up education, Peter, as well, because you, you've got kids, man. I, I'm, I'm interested. I mean, they still teach kids way too much long division as far as I'm concerned. And in, in first year college, the amount of like row reduction, Jordan canonical form stuff you have to do in algebra <laughs> is heart, heartbreaking um right. to, to be honest so what what should we be teaching people man uh wow <laughs> so we're gonna go there okay well i think that um we should be teaching people enough math it's a, it's sort of a a, a ratchet mechanism mm -hmm. you need to know enough math to feel confident and fluent to gain fluency so you can solve a certain set of problems, quantitative, do quantitative reasoning. And if you can do quantitative reasoning over certain kinds of problems, then you can approach more complex problems where you need the next tier of math. And you sort of kind of go like this. Um, but ultimately the goal is to give people intuition and fluency over reasoning about the world in a quantitative way. Mm. And that's not to say that we have a clockwork world, but if you don't have that, then the entire world appears to you as just as all just mystery. And what you really want is to, is to render the mechanistic parts mechanistic so you can actually see the mystery with more clarity, right? Um, which is why I just, there's a beautiful rock and mineral gem store near where my house used to be here in Austin. And I love going in there. What I didn't love was all the quantum magnetic healing kind of woo woo stuff there. And I'm like, listen, if, I mean, I didn't say this, but I'm just thinking there's all, because you'll overhear conversations and people will talk about this stuff. There wasn't a whole lot of like, you know, whatever, Mercury and retrograde or something, but there was a lot of like, there was a lot of quantum woo-woo. And I was just like, these people are so interested in the nature of the world. They want to know more natural philosophy, but they, they clearly, well, clearly they don't know quantum physics, but also they, I don't think that they had the skills to get they, they couldn't get there without a lot of like pedagogy. So the point is, I guess, in all of this rambling is that we should teach children what we know and to, to be self-sufficient in exploring that so they can then go to the frontier and then push the next level, right? Yep. And not be cowed by it and also not be not be um, hypnotized by, by fake complexity. The world will just get more and more filled with bling um, that's distracting, that's fake, that's just false kinds of complexity and people just get sucked into these vort vortices. So I said, I think long division, I mean, yeah, sure. We don't have to do a lot of long division, but if you don't get good at your times tables, and if you don't have some ability to look at least a three or maybe a four digit division thing, then some kinds of problems are just going to be a little bit harder for you. And then you lose the grade, you lose the way, yeah. right? But so the reason I, I stated those two examples, I think is because the inordinate amount of time we teach children to follow recipes. Like you can do it right. a few times or 10 times or even a hundred times, not like three years of, you know, <laughs> the product rule, a differentiation by part. I mean, I love that stuff. Don't get me wrong. But, um, and to your point, there is a lot of simulation. There is a lot of like wrestling and kayfabe, right? That we need to, need to make sure we don't get distracted by the, the shiny, shiny things all the time. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, well, we should, we should have another advanced Ukrainians conversation about that. I'm, I'm very, very excited for that. Yeah. Um, so just for a bit more context, <laughs> I do, um, and uh, I, I do have a, an industry podcast called Vanishing Gradients, which Peter has been on before, and you can, you can definitely check, check that out. And I promoted this on um, that, that recently. So um, I think it's all right to pr pr promote, promote <laughs> that, but Peter will be on, on there again. We have, we have a lot of interesting questions in, in the chat. Sure. And there are two Let's do it. I wanted to kind of bring in together. Um, a. Landon says, legibility at the level of code and data is is better than nothing, but isn't there a still a big interoperability problem with the internals of the models themselves? There's another question that I think is related, not the same, but HH has asked, when it comes to trusting an LLM, e.g. to file your taxes or generate legal filings, what do you think needs to happen for people to trust the output? So this is about trusting models and what we understand about them. 
Um, right. So I don't know if you yeah. can combine or answer those. Well, two. there's there's a lot of work happening right now in the yep. whole um, uh, un, uh, sort of getting into the, the 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 opaque innards of what do the weights mean and what do these networks actually code. Mm. Um, and and I don't I don't have any um, I don't have a magic answer for this right now, other than that. Yeah, you're right to be skeptical of them because it's a black box, right? But that being said, I also feel fairly confident that we will get to the bottom of it. And in fact, that we will not just get to the bottom of it, we may uncover some very surprising and interesting things uh, about the models themselves. Because ultimately, um, again, given how brute, just how ridiculously brute force and crude a transformer is, it's a bag of tokens. I mean, like, come on, you know, the fact that we can actually get to a latent semantic space behind this that actually can be used for transfer learning or for generating whatever things on the decoder side, the fact that we can actually distill this out means there is a compressible notation. There is a compressible well, notation is wrong term, a compressible representation somehow that can be achieved. Yeah. And, and if we pick at that and if we go, de you know, look at, well, what are the dot products between like, what is the covariance with a simpler thing? What are the, you know, how several is the space? And you know, really just go into that. And there are thousands and thousands of researchers way smarter than me who are doing that right now. I mean, I think we'll get to the bottom of what the representation space actually looks like. We may end up with a very different model than transformer model. Actually, the like code fusion, right? There's diffusion models right now that are not just not just for making pictures, but there's diffusion models that are different, but are approaching a similar kind of compression approach to try to build an eigenspace and, and representation. Um, I think all of those things will lead to more legibility about what's what's inside a transformer. Now, all that being said, be careful what you wish for. We may then realize all of a sudden, oh crap, like the human brain representation of these things is maybe not that special. Mm. And in fact, I was having a thought earlier today, just like, wait, hold on a second. Language itself is just this like relatively robust encoding across generations and across many different physical, you know, atomized brains. Um, but if we could actually get to some core representations, could we actually you know, imagine a future where you could uplift babies to you know middle high school level of knowledge in the space of years by giving them a very tuned and tweaked representation for their brains why would they have to spend all these years just learning oh a cat that's a cat there's a dog this is a thing and that's a thing like so much of what we do is adapting human babies into the language infrastructure that we all have shared over millennia Yep. But if you could go the other way around, if you actually have the compressed nugget, then you're going to build the high bandwidth connection between the compressed nugget of human knowledge and a baby's brain. And boom, now you've got eight-year-olds that have, you know, PhDs. Like, what would that be like, right? So we might, you know, anyway, these are the interesting things that, that lie ahead, I think. Absolutely. Um, you mentioned something a couple of times that I just want to unpack briefly because it is a, there is, there is I think it is a point of contention in some ways. Um, is generative AI compression or not? Well, it depends on what compression is, right? I mean, like, I think, uh, well, I mean, yeah, I mean, yeah, yes. Why, why, why isn't, why isn't it? Um, I, I think there are several potential answers. One is due to its generative capabilities, um, uh -huh. right? Like we don't usually think of uh, compression as having this probabilistic generative potential. Oh, yeah. It's a, it's a very useful compression. Because it's it's one thing if I look if I take a picture and I you know put in a zip file there's really we think one way to unzip the file and when I unzip the file I get that picture right but it turns out if I have a thing that I zip up a thousand pictures then not only can I unzip and get all thousand pictures out I can also weirdly unzip it and get new pictures out right that's that's different so it's not mere compression but it's certainly doing some kind of a compression. It's discovering a new basis into which, uh, which representations of all these different things are much more efficient, right? And it's encoding these things into that efficient representation. That, at least that's my internal model of what's really going on there. I, I could be wildly off, but I believe that that's, you know, that's my intuitive model of what's happening inside. Uh, so things. in that sense, it's a superset of compression. Y yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but it's this, because what's different about um, when you look, when you if you do long uh, RLE, like a run length encoding of a text stream, right, or mm -hmm. just of pixels, or you take 
a picture that's a grid and linearize and just do kind of row scan order of all the pixels. And anytime there's three pixels that are the same color or four, then you smush it into a single representation, the dumbest possible compression scheme, right? What that's doing is that's compressing at a, well, still a representation level, but it's compressing at the kind of the, just the pixel level. Um, and, and that compression only works for that particular image. Like if you go and do a different image, you'll have to scan the image again and, and compress it slightly differently. And so we think of compression as being an engine for generating these compressed artifacts. But I think if you look at compression in a more generic sense to say all of this stuff that happens in the space can be represented in a lower dimensional space, then I would say, yes, all of these artworks that you throw into like a stable, into, you know, stable diffusion, you can get a lot of them out with some level of fidelity. There's definitely some loss there. But to me, I, I mean, I would, I would define that as a kind of compression. Again, Absolutely. I don't know if I'm answering the question at all. I'm just kind of dancing. You are. The Let me, and I think, you know, we're at 70 minutes in, so I think we can go a bit, a bit deeper. Let's say okay. I were to take um, the Mona Lisa and tear uh -huh. it up. Um, heresy. Yep. Um, and then like, just make a collage out of all, all, all the pieces. Mm -hmm. Is that compression? If you make a collage out of all the pieces of the Mona Lisa, and the reason is I ask this is because in generative AI, we are doing these kind of really wacky transform, non-linear transformations. So it isn't just like projecting onto a lower dimensional space. It's not merely projecting. Um, no, no, it, it, but you could generate, well, sorry, I'm not understanding your question very well, Hugo. So if you were to shred up into little pieces, uh, which is, you know, sort of like what the ComNet sort of approach does or whatever, right? Yep. If you're to generate and create all these little pieces um, and you make a mosaic out of it, that's not a compression. That, that that's, a, that's I wouldn't call it a compression. It's a scrambling. It still took all those pieces. Uh, maybe I'm not understanding your question. Yeah, no, but I feel um, like that, that's at least one analogy for what what um, generative AI models do as, as well. Because you can't necessarily recreate the original unless you have, a particular prompt or something like that, right? Oh, oh, so maybe I'll I'll say this. If you were to take all the pieces of the Mona Lisa, um, or if, if I have a thing like, and I take a picture of the Mona Lisa and it outputs and it prints out uh, or displays on the screen, uh, literally every pixel, but just scrambled. So it just becomes colored yep. snow. And everything I take a picture of is just colored snow, okay? Then I would say that's not a compressor because you cannot recover the original in any way, shape, or form, right? Now, if what it does is it takes the thing of a different example, if I have a camera, it's a crappy camera with a low-res sensor, I take a picture of the Mona Lisa, maybe it's a very blurry lens that's all scratched to hell, right? The output is maybe a 16 by 16 grid of some colors that kind of look like there's a blob in the middle and some like background, not very good. That's still a compression in a sense because there is some correlation between that to the original, totally agree, right? but it's not clear which a transformer is actually doing or somewhere in between, right? Right, but here's the thing. If I take it and I come out, you know, I take a picture of this thing and I have a thing, it never displays the picture was that, that it took. But um, but if I can, if I describe the thing, it can make a picture very, 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 very close to it. Then it somehow had a representation of what that was because it could have displayed yep. colored snow. It could have displayed a bicycle. It didn't. It displayed a vaguely Italian looking, medieval era Italian looking woman with some background. Like I would say that's a high semantic correlation. And also there's repeatability to it, right? If every time I prompt it, it gives me something very similar to that. I would say it certainly seems like there's an internal compressed representation of this. You mm -hmm. know, if every time I did it, 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 nine times out of 10, it was a picture of a bicycle or a fish. And I would say, well, that's, you have a stochastic image generator, but you don't have a compression of yep. the source. So Okay, so this actually leads. I'm sure there's some signal processing expert on the uh, watching this who is, you know, he or she is just tearing their hair out. He's like, there's a mathematical formula characterizing oh, the entropy, of blah blah blah. They yeah, just dude. put up there. Well, These two idiots it. are just of, rambling. But anyway, course, I apologize to that person. Of course, <laughs> is this, of course, this is, of course, everything is compression if you go to Claude Shannon, right? I mean, like that, that dude was just levels levels above. Um, what a wonderful, wonderful dude and playful in, individual. Um. This does take us to a place, though, that I that that I think is really interesting, um, and it's something we've talked about before. I don't know if you've talked about this publicly, um, but a lot of people do kind of think of generative AI as like photocopiers and printers and that type of stuff. 
Um, and you exploded my brain once by telling me generative AI models aren't printers, they're unprinters. What is an unprinter and why are generative AI models unprinters, Peter? Ah, yes. Okay, great. Um, yeah, I say that they're, they're unprinters and uncopiers. Uh, so in, in IP law and in like sort of that space of discourse, there's, this, there's a, two, two wonderful terms, um, essence and expression. So there's the essence of an idea, which is something that, you know, lives in the mind of a person. Uh, and this, again, we're, we're in this philosophical space. We're talking about the moral rights of, of, of humans. Um, so we talk about, okay, there's the essence of an idea. We're not going to over philosophize into like, what is a conscious brain doing? And is there some quantum stuff or whatever? Mm -hmm. The point is we believe in consensus reality that human brains can hold the essence of ideas and they can express them in many ways. We can, you know, for me, I could write certain things in Chinese or English. I can take a art brush and like draw a picture, right? We can render, we can express ideas in many ways. If I, if I hear, you know, if I have a particular song in my head, I could hum it, I could whistle it, I could bang it on the piano or play it on my violin. Uh, I could write it down on a, on a, on a, on a, on the staff, you know, in, in, on the treble club staff. And then that's also a rendering an expression. So this yeah. idea is the idea is that we have, the essence of an idea, which is sort of inviolate in the human brain. You, and then there's like the, the expressions and almost all IP law that people typically deal with, those things are really governing the realm copyright law. I'm sorry. Actually copyright law governs the realm of expressions. Mm -hmm. Once something has been expressed, um, there are IP laws that govern ideas themselves. And, and interesting little corners around that as well. So if there's trade secrets, if you know the recipe for Coca-Cola because you are an employee of the Coca-Cola company, you are now bound legally to not, like if you sign the contract, you cannot yep. give that idea away. So it is possible to container to contain ideas, but there's a higher bar because now we're sort of governing what people can think. And so the law generally treads very carefully around that kind of stuff, yep. right? But that does exist, trade secrets. Uh, actually, if you have an idea, you can patent the idea. So patents are around ideas, mm -hmm. um, but you still have to, and that's why there's constraints around that as well. It has to be something that's useful art, has to be not obvious to a, 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 a practitioner or someone who's sort of, you know, uh, familiar with the, with the space. There's all these things around that. So we can, we do govern ideas and we can traffic in ideas, but generally not. That's the essence. And the expressions are what most people think about when they buy a piece of music, it's protected by copyright laws, the streaming rights, DRM, all this other kind of stuff. LLMs do this really horribly interesting thing, which is they can extract the idea out of any expression. Yep. And so now as someone who bought a piece of expression, if I buy a record, uh, a recording of a musician, what have I really bought? Have I bought? So one thing I haven't bought is I haven't bought the rights to play that song on the airwaves. I haven't bought the rights to play this movie in a theater. So even mm -hmm. around that, you know, there's some governance there, but if I get a recording of a thing, I have, do I have the right to then train an LM on it to extract essentially the essence out of the expression? Um, because that's what they do. That's the weird thing about them, that they're more than just compression. They and could you give, give a ideas. concrete example? I'm, I, it seems a bit silly to ask for a concrete example of, extracting essence but yeah could you could you give an example maybe one from stable diffusion one from llms or yeah so stable diffusion well so um so actually there's a i think was it stable diffusion or mid journey one of these um but they were they basically asked for a cartoon character um for a video game of a like an italian plumber thing yeah, and it okay. came out looking like mario yep and i don't know that it was ever trained on a picture exactly that picture of mario but it got the essence of the idea of Mario. You know, it's a me, a Mario. It's going yeah, yeah. got Mario somehow, right? There's yep. a Mario ness to it. Um, it's you know when when and you could do this with a ChatGPT. It's trained on you know the lyrics of Eminem songs. You can have it actually write a rap song in the style of Eminem. The yeah. essence has been extracted. And if you were to ask it for specifically, now I haven't done this in a while since the very beginning. But if you narrow down the topic to one that actually Eminem did rap about. You know, it could produce something very similar to that. So the what we think of as styles, whatever those styles have come out of that. So the style thing is there. I mean, style transfer was being done with GANs, you know, five, six yeah, years yeah, ago. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. But but the essence, what I mean by essence here is that 
it now it has the ideas because now if you actually talk to ChatGPT or type to it and ask it about relating the ideas in one book to another book, a nonfiction book, it's very conversant in the sense of it can relate. Like I'm asking about like some history of economic stuff. It knows, knows, it has somehow the ideas embedded inside. It has extracted the ideas of Adam Smith. It has extracted the ideas of Schumpeter. It's extracted yeah. the ideas of all these different people. And it can relate them to ideas of, you know, contemporary economists and other articles I'm reading. It's extracted an essence out of the exact words. It can actually quote certain words as well, although they put real filters on them to keep it, you know, within the copyright guardrails. But mm. but in a general un whatever filtered LLM, it it ex has extracted these ideas out of the source text. It's not merely taking a picture, right? Absolutely. I appreciate your incredibly nuanced um take and, and thoughts on that. I so we're gonna have to wrap up soon. I do I do have a couple more questions i'd like to get into the first one we've already talked about the future of the pi data ecosystem in the age of generative ai um what changes for anaconda uh with generative ai becoming what it is and of course the first thing that changes is peter wang becomes chief ai officer um <laughs> but what else happens at, at anaconda and the ecosystem well you know anaconda qua anaconda i think there's a lot that um you know i, I would say very crassly the total addressable market has exploded, right? Because it used to be, well, you would talk to Anaconda if you need to govern or use or run whatever kind of like some Python workloads. And, you know, someone say, well, I have a team of 50 data scientists. Or I have a team of 20 data scientists. Or I have some, you know, engineers here on staff doing some, you know, whatever NumPy, SciPy stuff. But if you say, well, who here in the business is going to want to use LMs and want to use LMs in a governed way and want to do efficient numerical Python processing. Now all of a sudden everybody does, right? Mm. So the business opportunity is actually quite large for us and really great. And because it all sits on top of this open source ecosystem, businesses need to govern it. Businesses need to have somebody who can actually be a vendor of record behind these things. Someone, you know, to curate the models or someone to actually, you know, certainly ship them secure code and let them know when there's vulnerabilities. Those are the kind of the bread and butter things that we've done as a business. And we'll continue to do that moving forward. So for Anaconda, that part doesn't change, except we just have to get better at executing and scaling that because the demand now is much, much bigger. Um, in terms of what comes next for us, you know, um, at the end of the day, the vision for the business and for the company was to try to empower the world um, to really think about, to be, to, to be empowered with computers um, and data literacy and to be able to think about the world in a quantitative way, to make inferences, make predictions. And, and that essentially is the heart of every successful business. That's not just in the mundane task of rent capture, right? Any business to grow has to get better and smarter at thinking about its customers, thinking about its supply chain, thinking about its products. And so we think there's a tremendous amount of opportunity to help businesses take advantage of LLMs in this way or whatever comes beyond LLMs. So I think that as I'm in the chief AI officer role, as I'm looking at what is important, um, there's things that we're good at doing. There's things that we've historically done pretty well. And that is thinking about how to create a commons ecosystem for innovation, how to be really a neutral Switzerland in the middle of mm. big giant trillion dollar giants battling over user mind share, over standards and things like that. And we're not a trillion dollar company. We're, we're really, you know, but, but we do hold a certain amount of gravitas and credibility in the ecosystem to, to hold for at least keeping the innovation landscape somewhat of a level playing field. And I think that's a really important role for us moving forward is to be a steward for that North Star that, because um, otherwise businesses generally left to themselves are going to look for economies of scale, Walt Gardens, capture, capture, capture. And they think in a very zero sum way when it comes to innovation. And we, of course, think in a very positive some way, growing the pie, making a bigger and bigger ecosystem. Um, one thing that I think also materially changes here is that, and if VCs are starting to tune into this, you can create extremely valuable businesses, I think now, with um, relatively fewer headcount. So I look forward to an ecosystem, uh, well, to the world transforming into many, many more smaller companies doing really effective things. And then we can be a platform, a partner, um, you know, strategic partner or platform for those kinds of companies and, and, uh, and, and helping all of those folks kind of inhabit this innovation landscape rather than just everyone paying Jensen a few bucks, paying, you know, Satya or paying like Tim Cook or AWS or whatever, you know, like there's just, there's gotta be something better in terms of an open innovation ecosystem than just a few trillion dollar giants capturing all of it. 
right? Yeah. So um, that's that's kind of what we stand for, and that's kind of you know what I'm looking for engaging with with the community around those kinds of things. Fantastic, and you know the whole community has always been hugely inspired by and appreciated um, the Pi Data and Continuum, and now Anacondas. Um, the work you've all put into, as you would say, more generative, non-rivalrous, open source technologies and really trying to grapple with with infinite games as opposed to to finite yeah. games. Um, yeah, thank you. I, I think to to wrap up on, on, on that note, I as you know, um people who watch watch these fireside chats are technical data scientists, developers, mach machine learning engineers, platform engineers, mm -hmm. CTOs. Um, who are really interested in staying and keeping up with what's happening with Python, with generative AI. Um, I'm just wondering if you have any advice for them and quite explicitly to, to build cool things, but also to stay employable in the next couple of decades. Um, right. So advice there would, would be eminently helpful, Peter. Um, well, staying on taps, I mean, I think Twitter is still a pretty happening place for this kind of stuff. There's a lot... Of folks there there are some really really good newsletters and whatnot as well that uh you know sebastian rashka has a really great one there's there's awesome. there's others as well um but uh you know uh in general um just staying in tune and in touch with what's going on obviously I'd love people follow me on linkedin and twitter and whatnot um but, and but your, there's, P, your p wang on 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 uh twitter? on twitter and, and then peter on wang. LinkedIn, yeah and on, on linkedin just peter wang anaconda you can find me yep. but um but then in terms of the skills that are needed and what's coming, I think a lot of the, the last five or six years of orchestration, cloud orchestration complexity and some of these kinds of things, um, obviously folks like uh, like you guys at Outer Bounds and many others are trying to rationalize these stacks and trying to make them usable and much easier to deal with. Um, but but I think that in time, some of that complexity will, will be smoothed over, right? And uh, and hopefully we'll get to an end of like, you know, every six months of VC throws a landscape chart together with even more 10, 10 times more logos of the previous one. Yeah. Uh, well, we see another quadrant or something, right? There's always a quadrant, you know, there's always a quadrant. And so I think we're going to get to with, with, with generative AI, people are going to have to, I think people are really going to have to sit down and think about what are they trying to do with their information systems? Yes. What are they really trying to do? Get off of just the tech cycle and just think about, no, seriously, like, can you, you can, you actually have the opportunity to plumb from an end end use thing all the way to a source thing. And, um, and, and think about building that in an ideal way. And if you're a machine learning expert, or if you are a practitioner in this space right now, <coughs> don't, I would say, um, Maybe the TLDR is don't be bound by small ambition to like, oh, just tweak this problem or build a little tool for that. But really think about what is the learning of the previous projects we've done or what are people really trying to do? Because a lot of those complexities, I really think that as the code models and code system models get better, we're going to end up being able to auto-generate and really kind of smooth over some of these kinds of things. And people will gravitate towards simpler stacks that, facil that, that afford that kind of an approach. So it's not even like the complexity will continue to spiral. People are going to go over the simpler stuff where they just spin up X, Y, Z. Mm. <clears throat> so then I think most of the people who are here who are skilled in those technical areas, I would really strongly encourage people to get closer to the front end of the business, right? And understand what is the business trying to achieve here? How can we really guide that strategically all the way to the source data, the source models, whatever? Right. I don't know if that makes sense. I'm, I'm about it, to choke. That, that's that, 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 that's <laughs> wonderful advice. And I'll be following it myself as well. Um, I just want to thank everyone for for joining um, and, and sticking around. There are still 70 people watching watching live who've stuck around for, <laughs> for an hour and a half, which is super cool. And But most of all, I, I just want to thank you, Peter, for your endless expertise and patience and, um, and, and wisdom as well and for everything you've done. And I look forward to the next conversation we have as well. Thank you so much, Hugo. Yeah, thanks for the great questions and thanks everyone for listening to this. This has been Absolutely. a lot of fun. Thank you. Awesome. And scene. Dude. All right, there we go. <laughs> that was 